thank you all. It's been a, it's been a long day. Um, <laughs> when I first came in, I was listening to Susan go through some data points. And you know, the worst thing you can tell a journalist is they're naive, but I still am amazed at how horrified I am by some of the data, and I feel, boy, I'm still so naive. So the first thing Kate said to me today is, oh, we don't need to talk about data and numbers. But without data and information, you can't really build a case. And Kate has been so extraordinary in having clear priorities and getting buy-in for them. And, you know, one of the things that I think that we need to think clearly about is what should our priorities be? I mean, Kate has dedicated her life to issues of sexual violence and harassment, and I think, you know, that is one of the most important priorities that we should focus on. So, I, you've been listening to a lot of stories about people today, you know, Kate is gonna talk about what she has done in Australia and how she created the buy-in for it. Because I often think, you know, that a lot of us are talking to ourselves. But what we have to do is talk to the people who aren't in the room. And during one of the sessions of Turn to Your Neighbors, I was sitting next to somebody there, Naha, and she was saying, we should all be bringing people to this conference who aren't already converted. So I'm gonna start out by delegating totally to Kate <laughs> to talk to us about how you did achieve what you did in Australia, which, you know, she has made Australia look pro progressive just single-handedly, Kate. <laughs> Um, Only downhill Penny. from here for you now. Penny, thank you. <laughs> uh, last week, Henny and I had a conversation, and it was a great conversation, and she said, Kate, if we can just have that conversation again, that would be great. It had nothing to do with what was just said then. Um, so we're having a new conversation. Uh, just to start with the clarifying, um, when I said to Henny just now, we don't need to talk data, is you've actually had a lot of data. I think uh, that revelation, she said, I thought I was cynical, but clearly not cynical enough. Those numbers are really bad, and, and we should think about that. Um, so just to start, if I start there, I'm absolutely not someone saying we don't need facts and data. That's actually very much recognised in Australia as the starting point. And it's partly recognised because um, when I started in this role, so just to give people some context, I'm the Australian Sex Discrimination Commissioner. And that role is a role that was established in 1984 when Australia first signed up to the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Violence, uh, of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Uh, we established the Sex Discrimination Act and this position was established. And the job description really is to advance gender equality, to address sex discrimination and to protect women and girls' human rights. So it, it is a big um, mandate, but the reality is we're part of the Human Rights Commission, which is a small agency, about 120 people, government funded in the amount that government wants to fund you, which is not all that much. And so a lot of my job is about strategically what will have the most impact. Um, but if I go then forward, just to be clear, there's two things I would say, which is in Australia we have almost all the same problems we're talking about at this summit. Uh, the challenges, and I'll talk to you what the key challenges are. Uh, so we've had some progress and I am not going to take home the stats on women on boards because none of us are very happy in Australia about our slow progress for women on boards, women on senior executive roles. So I'm not going to go home and tell them that you think that's good um, because 
it's not good enough, it's not equality, it's not respect um, that we need. Uh, but there are a lot of people in Australia who are cleverly thinking about how they can use their positions and their influence and their resources to make change. So to some degree, speaking on behalf of what's happening in Australia, there is just as much opposition in Australia to gender equality as there is everywhere else. Um, but there is also some super clever people who are doing some really interesting work. So if I, you've opened to me, so if I then go to that question about priorities. So we've had the Sex Discrimination Act since 1984. Uh, we should have this fixed by now. Uh, so when I started in the role in 2016, I was appointed for five years in the role. And at the start of the, that, my predecessor had had a lot of impact. Um, and there was this sense in Australia that everyone seems to be talking about gender equality. So particularly some male champions of change, so male CEOs were all very much advocating for women into leadership roles, or so people felt. Um, and so when I started, I thought, look, the reality is I'll go to the facts. I'll, let me look at, uh, because I've always said I started at a point where I think there'd never been so much momentum around gender equality, but I would also say there'd never been so much opposition. So there was really very much a sense of you've gone too far, you're just getting greedy, women have it all, now you want more than that. Um, so a lot of conversations about that. So when I went to... That that accounts for the backsliding that, that we were talking about. And the backlash about. as well. So it was very loud. Um, so so when, when I went back to the facts in Australia, what I found was we have done really well on educating women and girls. So women and girls, uh, we are number one with a lot of other countries um, on the World Economic Forum uh, global rankings, absolutely, women and girls through primary school, secondary school, tertiary, both educated at equal and even higher rates than men and doing better than boys and men. Uh, we have laws. So my position, for example, that suggests we're really quite progressive. The Sex Discrimination Act particularly was really early in developing laws on sexual harassment. And one of my colleagues that I'm going to defer to here, Kate Eastman, who's in the front, who's here, who's saying don't, uh, was at the Human Rights Commission when I started my professional life. And I used to run sex, sex, sexual harassment cases before her at the Human Rights Commission. And we both, 25 years later, despair at the, at the progress that hasn't happened that we hoped. But when I looked at the data, there were three priorities that were really still something that we were working on in Australia. The first one is violence against women and girls. So we know, for example, and there's a lot of momentum now in Australia on looking at family violence. One woman a week dies at the hands of a current and for, or former intimate partner and children as well. Every um, two weeks, a child dies. Uh, that has really captured uh, the country. Uh, not perhaps enough, some of us would say, but certainly has created momentum on looking at improving gender equality. Sexual harassment, sexual violence, online violence, all very gendered, very much at risk for women. The second thing that we are not great at is women in leadership roles. And as you've discussed today, actually any kind of uh, diversity in leadership. So we often say, you know, the biggest minority is white Anglo men, and they seem to be uh, very well benefiting from the opportunities. We just want all the other so-called minorities to get the same opportunities. Uh, so we still have had only one female prime minister, one governor, female governor general. So we're very much a country in the moment of ones. And when we get one, then we really analyse them with much more rigour than we do uh, for any other um, roles. The third area that I've been really passionate about that's a real problem is women's economic security. So I'm answer taking a long time to answer that, Annie. 
Um, oh, I love I'll, this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so women's economic security. And uh, again, these conversations, there's been lots of talk about caring and who does the unpaid work, who with the elder care, with the, um, an ageing population, which as, as you said is good news, uh, but there is a lifetime accumulation for women in Australia of poverty. There's a very strong connection still with a very traditional model of a family, male breadwinner, female carer, that accumulates over a lifetime from school when girls are pushed towards jobs that earn less at university, the pay gap, uh, loss of money when you're in the child rearing ages, only earning half the super, superannuation over time, having to spend more money on your makeup and clothes, and even when we sort of win out, living longer than men, uh, we don't have the same money to live on. So even the good news, which is you're going to live longer, is not good news if you don't have the money to live. And our stats on poverty of single women in old age are high as well. So those are the three priorities. And in doing my jobs, I really have chosen to focus on three settings. Uh, that is the workplace, education and sport. So it was great to hear a fencer up here. Um, that in each of those, we're getting momentum, but the idea is you need to really choose the places that have a high impact opportunity for change, and you need to do multiple things at the same time. So a lot of what I do, but also what others in the sector in Australia do, is look for those um, opportunities, push and push and push, and at some point, like one of the CEOs I know, he says it's like an elephant pushing on a house, just keep pushing, it looks like nothing's happening, uh, but the foundations are shaking and from time to time we get a bit over and that's what we're aiming for. So I was just before you said, you know, we've got to do simultaneously on many fronts, I was going to ask you what is the proper sequence? Because many of us who come from the US, and I've been a permanent resident of Hong Kong for 20 years now, think you couldn't get the Bill of Rights. You couldn't get half the constitutional amendments in the states passed today. We are going backwards, not forwards. So just talk us for a minute through 1994. What was the voting like? Was there a lot of opposition? Was there debate? Was it, did it become a very partisan kind of issue? And today, given the role of social media, given the increasing tribalism, given you know, the forces that are taking us, the backlash, uh, as you said, you know, T talk us through 1994, what are the lessons? Should we start with the legislation or should we kind of work around the politics since the politics in most places are becoming so toxic? Yeah, I think 84, is that what you mean? That's when our act came in. That's what yeah. you're, yes, yeah. yes. Um, one of the things that you said in that question and that we've talked about is this idea that there's sort of you know, inevitable progress towards um, positive change. And one of the things that we have to quickly acknowledge is that it's not incremental and it's not on a nice upward slice. So even when at the start the great video said how many years it would take to achieve gender equality, well, that's assuming things progress at the pace that they're going right now. And so some, one of the things that I'm really convinced about when I've come into this role is people, people and particularly men in more senior roles have told me to acknowledge that change takes time. And You're you, too impatient. You don't, you don't well, it, it change isn't inevitable. So I always say change takes action. And yes, that might take time, but you're not doing anything different so no change isn't going to happen. So one of the things in the conversation that you've said is I think, um, and I guess I'm the generation, so I'm uh, 51, 
And when I came through university, these laws were all being passed and we were, you know, it was the 60s and 70s, social change, we're in a particular era. Um, and so I knew the rights and I always expected by this time I wouldn't, I was 20 years in a law firm, I was the only female partner, their second in the group I was in, they've just appointed their second female partner this year, 20 years after I was appointed and I was meant to congratulate them and Stunning. I couldn't even, Stunning. I couldn't even utter a word, I just said, yep, great and they told me how many kids she had. And I just went, I can't believe women can think and have children. It's just remarkable. Anyway, <laughs> so, so I think that that idea of um, it increases naturally. And also your question suggested a sequence. So one of the things that I get asked at these forums is often, what's the one, if you could only have one thing, what's the one thing you would do? And I just, that is just not what we're talking about here. If there was one thing... You, I'd be telling everyone. Um, so the idea that we have to just focus on one thing while we go about our lives, you know, it's, it's uh, that question even. So Pudger and I got, you know, do you need to change family, work or society? And we said all of those things at, all the, at same the same time. time. So that was a trick question. So I didn't vote just to be sorry about that. But that... It doesn't um, undermine that question. It recognises that they all intersect. So I'm going to do a long introduction to my next question. I was at a hedge fund conference in Monaco some years ago. There were a 1,000 men and seven women. And the seven women all had dinner together. We didn't know each other. And we went around the room, and what we found out was all of us had working mothers and the majority of us, though not me, were the only female, and all the others were brothers. So one of the people there was um, the founder of PAMCO, not to be confused with PIMCO, um, Pacific Asset Management. And she said, growing up, I didn't know I was a girl. You know, I was just one of the boys, because I had four brothers. Who was your role model growing up? Um, it's interesting too, there's someone in Australia has done some research on the CEOs, the top 100 CEOs and on their family structures and the research tells us that the men who are in those CEOs roles tended to grow up in a very conventional family structure where the father was the primary breadwinner, the mother was stay at home and the women tended to be the exact opposite, very unconventional families, a parent had died, there was divorce um, or that they weren't following the role. So I suspect um, that is about this role modelling, this idea of the social expectation. So, so I grew up in an orchard and if anyone... Uh, so sort of regional country but sort of in, encroaching suburbia. Um, so I... My mother, this is always the mother story, very much 50s, still is challenged by the fact that I seem to not be at home looking after my kids, but actually in practice, she... Um, we worked on the orchard. She cooked for all the Italian fruit pickers. She looked after us. She drove the tractors, picked the fruit, and then when they sold the orchard, she ran the business. So my mother has actually been the earner, the worker, she's done it all. And my father has been a very traditional but loving um, and not intrusive but very much the I'm, I'm the man so it doesn't do anything domestically. So I often, when I've taken on these roles, people always ask me, tell me about your background. I say I have this amazing mother. Um, uh, and I would say also where does the fire come from? Well, you know, I grew up with a sexist father. So, uh, I did... You're the first people I've ever said that publicly to. I privately say it all the time. 
So my mother has told me when I was born and they did the wills, dad was going to give everything to my brothers and nothing to me and my mother will, would not have and will not have a bar of that and my father is fine with this. He's completely with... He doesn't entirely understand what I do now but nor did he understand while I was a lawyer either because he is an orchardist. So um, beautiful people and things can change but so I think I, I had brothers and yes, I didn't... I didn't have a sense, I have a really strong sense of justice and the idea that I would miss out on opportunities because of my gender just didn't make sense to me. That is very inspiring to hear. We are running out of time. Um, one of the questions that your staff suggested I ask you, which I think is very interesting, and, but I do not know whether it's relevant for Hong Kong or not, is that societies that have made the most progress on gender equality tend to be more homogeneous, and your staff suggested Scandinavia. Why do you think that is? And, you know, how do you look on Hong Kong? You know, do you see it as diverse or no? Does it make you feel more or op less optimistic? You've been here all day. So, um, yeah. <laughs> I wish my staff had told me that, um, that that's what they said to you. Can I, can I, I, I'm happy to talk to anyone on that topic because we do look like, we always talk about Iceland and all these other things. But remember, Iceland is a half a million people. Uh, so um, I guess there's a couple of things I'd just say and then maybe um, you can just have a look. There's a couple of things that are happening at the moment. So I'm pivoting the question just completely from what you asked me to what I want to make sure I at least mention. Please. Um, which is I'm that... I'm happy to delegate yeah, the questions know, to you, as well, as, well as the answers. Okay. <laughs> um, one, one thing that um, the Human Rights Commission has done really well long past is about this data, is about finding the facts and using that to develop new policy. And so we've had a number of pieces of work that have been really successful at creating change. And one of the them, so I've bought my show and tell. One of them that I talked this morning to Hong Kong University about was a, a survey we did of all 39 universities called Change the Course. And I know the Equal Opportunity Commission here has released this year a survey of the universities in Hong Kong. And I think that's an incredibly valuable piece of work. So what I am actually working on right now that I'm really keen for you to um, check out is a national inquiry on sexual harassment. So our laws came in in 84 and there really hasn't been much change. But when the Me Too conversation hit, uh, Australia is, as a country, even the politicians, they don't like to admire a problem for too long. They want to solve it. So that was the first moment where more than just the people in the sector actually understood that sexual harassment's still happening. So we're currently doing a national inquiry. We're due to report later this year or earlier next year. And we know that the problems we're talking about are very much the same as here. So my sense yep. on Hong Kong is that it's very much the same problems. Uh, we might on some things have made more progress, but I actually think we're very consistent in the challenges, and so we can learn from each other. Unfortunately, it is my sad responsibility to say time is up. Thank you so much. We will look forward to hearing from you again.